Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV, powered by Harrington Star, global leaders in financial technology recruitment. Head over to harringtonstar.com where you'll be able to see some of the greatest jobs in financial technology recruitment across the world. You'll also be able to find a host of insight to help you grow your brand, your team, your network and your career. You can see the latest financial technology salary survey. You'll be able to download the issue of the financial technologist focusing on the appetite for disruption. And our latest top 1% workplace awards will be out at the end of this year. If you work for a company that's a great place to work in financial technology, we want to hear from you. Enjoy the show, and I'll see you soon. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. I am absolutely thrilled to have on the show here a man who needs no introduction, someone who is uh, famous throughout the banking space all over the world, literally all over the world. I think we said before there's uh, 115 different countries you've been in over the last week or so, so uh, a little bit longer than that maybe. But uh, coming live from Estonia at the moment, it's Emmanuel. Daniel, how are you? I'll be very happy to be back uh, with you. And in fact, uh, I was just thinking uh, from the last time we chatted, chatted um you know the things that have happened in the industry amazing right so so much to talk about uh we already had so much to talk about when we first uh talked and then now uh to build on what we have to cover so let's let's get go- rolling absolutely absolutely and, and uh look, for, for the purpose of the viewers here that last time we were recording we had massive wi-fi issues as you were globe trotting all around the world so we uh we got a great recording but it wasn't good enough for the viewers to see so we thought right we'll do it again we'll rerun the fun and now we've got even more stuff to talk about as the industry continues to evolve at pace and do some really interesting things. So, look, we've got lots to talk about, lots to get involved in, in, in a, uh, a, fan, a fantastic financial service industry. Um, and all the tech that's behind it is, is growing at an extraordinary pace. You've written a book um, which talks a little bit about the evolution of the banking uh, sector, which you're going to introduce to us in a second. But before we get on to the book, tell us a little bit about you and your background. So Toby, I'm I'm the found my my calling card is that I'm the founder of uh, the Asian Banker uh, from Singapore. Uh, originally, you know, used the Asian Banker to build um, relationships and and understand the industry worldwide. Um, first, uh, across the Asia Pacific region, uh, when you when you start something that is banking centric, you actually have um, the excuse to walk into any country. Uh, and meet uh, the people who run uh, the largest financial institutions in in each of these countries. So it was also an opportunity for me to uh, absorb uh, countries and, and, um, you know, civilizations. Uh, And the country that I I spent um, a considerable amount of time uh, has been China. Um, And uh, I started Asian Bank in 1996. 2000, um, the chairman of uh, the largest bank in China came to Singapore uh, and he asked to have lunch with me, and I didn't really understand, um, you know, what the significance of that was. Uh, but in two, uh, by 2001, China joined WTO. Uh, 2004, this bank, ICBC, um, you know, became one of the largest listed institutions in the world, $20 billion. Uh, and so were the, the other four uh, large banks in China. Uh, and in that time, since then, I've had a front seat view uh, of uh, so many amazing developments uh, in China. And then from there, we, we built the Asian banker into the Middle East, into Africa. Uh, and you know, the f- interesting thing is that um, in the book that I've written, right, the, the, the foreword is written by Barney Frank, who, who co-authored the, the Dot Frank Act. And then um, you ask, how is it that I, you know, I am acquainted with a number of the interesting, per- you know, amazing personalities in the US. And that's because when you're from Asia, uh, the the leading American bankers, when they go to Asia, they have all the time in the world for you because they, they want need to understand that. But if I were to meet them in New York, uh, you know, they I have to stand in line and, you know, I probably have 15 minutes of their time. So so in this way, uh, that's how you build a global business from starting from wherever you are. Uh, so that's uh, that, that in short is uh, has been Be my useful. story. Yeah. Be useful. And, and uh, you've got a copy of the book there, I know, as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's fascinating. We'll, we'll, try and, we'll try and get it non blurred out somewhere in there. But it's yeah, uh, not quite blurred it, out. But uh, <laughs> if, I, if I bring it closer to you, uh, you would see that there is a picture of a ice block uh, on the cover. Um, and, and the message there is that 
uh, I talk about the, the personalization of finance. Uh, so the title of the book is The Great Transition, which is the great transition that the financial industry is going through. Uh, and that it's transitioning into the personalization of finances here. Uh, and I use the ice block to, uh, to create the metaphor that uh, in the old days, uh, ice was something that you that you saw out of the lakes of Michigan or, or you know Boston, and and uh, and then you put it on horse-drawn carriages and and you carry it to the city. And imagine how much of wastage and uh, uncertainties that are involved when you do when we did that, um, you know. And what is ice today? It's something that is well within your control, um, you know, in in a refrigerator. Now, money is exactly that today, which is. Um, the money that is in our pockets but would have swelled the world round twice, uh, being subject to uh, interest rates, exchange rates, uh, bank charges, a whole range of factors that are not within our control, uh, inflation, um, and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and that's how much wastage is involved. Uh, in the money business, um, you know, and and uh, and what will make a difference to personalized money um, in just the same way that um, you know chloro, fluoro, carbon, which is like the CFC, uh, the, the the synthetic chemical that made the freezing of water possible. Um, I I I, I um, um, pin down four elements that will make um, you know the personalization of finance uh, eventually a reality. It is a reality today, technically. Uh, if the fact that you and I can transact with each other uh, on on a cryptocurrency without having an intermediary, that's that's uh, that's decentralization, uh, or that's um, that's uh, you know getting rid of the intermediary, uh, but. The, the technologies that need to be perfected include identity, um, value, or, or the, token, the ability to transact value, uh, verification, uh, and the ability to carry information. Uh, you know, um, something I do when I go to London, by the way, is I always make a trip to the British Museum uh, because uh, in, the, in the Assyrian Babylonian side of the exhibitions, uh, there are you know the, um, the 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 tokens that that are uh, that are that have, that have inscriptions of entire contracts that are that are passed on uh, you know between buyer and seller and so on. Right. Uh, and, and today we have the digital version of that. Uh, you know so. You know, so so I, so you, you can you, you can see that um, you know I I I, um, I draw from um, all that we have developed in civilization to um, you know to to come to an understanding of uh, where uh, finance is going. And as I was completing the book, uh, I realized that, uh, and I say this in the last chapter that. If finance is going to be personalized, then entire societies are going to be personalized, and it has implications in the way we organize and all that. Um, so that's why the last time we met, we we had you know we had so much to talk about, and we could have gone in any every which direction. So let's see where you know which of these themes we are going to pick on pick, pick on today. There's definitely a lot of directions we can go go in off that, and I think the, the that whole concept I think is probably a uh, a point of friction right at the moment, or a point of resistance, should we say, about the. Uh, you know the the uh, um, you know central co central coin stable coins etc and where people you know move with that and what people's uh, thoughts are about you know Orwellian sort of uh, you know government etc and where we where, you know, where we go with it. I, I think this is this is one of the the either the accelerators to the blockers of finance right. We're looking for something there that's friction free. We're looking for something that's digital. We're looking for for a different type of uh, of banking. We we said beforehand before coming on air we were talking very much about the whole concept of people wanting a digital experience and a different sort of play that isn't necessarily a complete revolution within finance but it's an evolution within it and i, I sort of suggested to you that that, that I've, I've been hearing for 10 15 years that there's a, a revolution in fintech but i think it's a very advanced ev evolution of uh, driven by a very very quickly advancing technology stack that comes behind it that technology stack has probably been a, um you know, increased in velocity even more with the advancements in AI of recent years. And it's a very, very exciting time that we sort of sit in at the moment. So from where we were as a banking industry in this very traditional sort of world to where we can potentially be in the future with this sort of, um, you know, decentralized opportunity, needing the traditional finance to move into it, the traditional finance world, needing an elements of the decentralized world to come into it. It gives us a, a, a fintech industry that I think has got this generational opportunity to be something absolutely uh, incredible at the moment and for, for great entrepreneurs and innovators to not necessarily completely disrupt the model 
but to make it something there which is far more um, usable and and you know, regulatable and and safe and and uh, uh, and actually just as I said, friction free as we possibly can. So give me your your view on that, where the where the industry sits today, and what sort of opportunities we've got ahead of us. Yeah, you know uh, everything that you've said um, is highly is loaded, right? So we we let's um, um, you know peel the onion as it were. Now the first thing is that. Uh, when we t- when we discuss uh, innovation, is that if the product doesn't change, nothing changes. Okay, remember mm-hmm. I said this uh, because yeah, I, think you call, I think you called it, and I love I love what you called it. It's, it was banking's Kodak moment, right? Uh, B- banking's Kodak moment. I gave this speech in 2017. It's it's on my blog, and I said, look, um, Kodak. Li- technically invented the digital film in, in a digital camera. Okay, I, I, there's a photo of it. It's, it looked like a, the size of a tissue box, um, you know, and in 1995, uh, together with uh, other players uh, at the same time as other players. Uh, 2001, um, Sony in, introduced um, the Cybershot, which was the first digital uh, camera, um, you know, that was available for consumers. 2007, um, the iPhone was invented. And 2010, Kodak went into liquida- liquidation. It's incredible, right? isn't it? And, and um, uh, why? Because they continued to love their uh, 35 mm physical film. Uh, and they were selling that as long as they could. And by the time they started turning costs in 2003 or four, uh, the, the, the cost structure of their business uh, uh, was sitting on them. Uh, you know, and, and the rest of it was, um, was uh, dealing with um, debt that they couldn't clear and so on. So the, 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 so the question that I asked myself was, what is the, the, the 35 mm film of the banking industry? And in my book, which was published last year, I said that the most beloved of products, the humble deposit account uh, needed to be um, re- revolutionized. Um, and um, and the, the case that I made was this, that um, the, in the old days, the banking industry's um, you know, deposit account was the way in which you and I uh, generated wealth or preserved wealth, at least the compounded interest uh, looked after us. But today, banks don't pay interest at all. Um, you know, hardly anything because their their uh, net interest margins have collapsed, uh, and so they're not passing that on to us. And then uh, the rise of the digital wallets uh, of all kinds, um, I- including from uh, instant pay type of wallets that the banks have, the telcos, uh, and then the super apps. Uh, and also the cryptocurrency players, uh, you know, and where you need to um, it, uh, to to locate your your digital assets. And today we have a whole range of digital wallets that uh, where the purpose of a digital wallet is util- utility uh, and functionality, and no longer preserving wealth. Um, you know, and so and then the next phase that we will be going into. Uh, is utility in a metaphysical world, which, which is mm. both physical and the metaverse. Uh, you know, and we need a token that will carry us into into that realm. Um, so, as I was thinking through how uh, the deposit business will evolve, uh, I said in the book that don't be surprised that one day uh, banks will uh, end up competing on the issuance of their own uh, stable coins, okay? And I outlined this trend in order to guide me uh, in, in terms of seeing how the industry develops. And at the time of writing, many bankers you know, pushed back on me and said, no, that's not going to happen. The regulators are not going to allow that and all that. Um, and the thing about understanding how trends carry uh, is to start with a thesis of where it's going and then trying to fit in all the noise that is taking place in the industry and seeing whether they add up. And right now, they're still adding up um, in that direction, uh, I believe. Uh, and it's just a matter of time before uh, the deposit business disintegrates and, and becomes something new. Now, another point to be made from what you've just said is this, that um, the players that originally thought that they were going to disrupt the banking industry, the the peer-to-peer players, for example, and so on. Uh, guess what? All of them on both sides of the pond, right? Uh, the the English and the, the British and the uh, and the American ones uh, ended up uh, applying for banking licenses themselves. In fact, there's yeah. no major peer-to-peer player uh, that that has not applied for a banking license or, or is already a bank. 
Uh, and I've heard, um, I've listened to one of the one of them, the, the CEOs, telling me that there's a reason for uh, getting into the uh, into the leverage business and all that, uh, which was total nonsense. Uh, <laughs> what I think, what I think uh, will be happening, by the way, is that we will see a second iteration of the peer-to-peer -peer players. And what I think happened uh, with the peer-to-peer -player players in the first iteration is that they also define their products in the same way that the banks did. If a peer-to-peer -peer platform uh, thinks that it's in a mortgage business, uh, it eventually falls into the same regulatory and, and customer relationship uh, models uh, as a traditional bank. Uh, so inevitably, they, they end up with the same costs as a, as a, as a traditional bank. Uh, and, and then they, they end up asking themselves, well, why don't we just apply for a banking license? Uh, because uh, you know, the, the factors are almost the same. <clears throat> now, what I think will be happening uh, is that AI uh, is going to uh, re-energize the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, platform industry. Uh, mm -hmm. And there, the product has to be the conversation, that the focus of peer-to-peer -peer players is not so much to dish out as many mortgage loans as possible, but give an excuse uh, for as many potential users as possible to be handing over data that they can then translate into products that make sense. Okay, yeah. And that product will not be mortgages. And AI machine learning is going to enable that, except that our mindsets cannot um, you know, continue to predicate the, the business uh, as if uh, we are a traditional bank, but without the intermediation business. So, so I, I do see that the intermediation business as, and especially the peer-to-peer -peer model uh, will see a, a resurgence of, their, of the business model. But I, what I'll say to the peer-to-peer -peer players is that the data is your business. The conversation is your business. And from the yeah. conversation, you'll be Absolutely. looking at products that don't exist today. Yeah. And that's, that's that, you know, I, I constantly think about that. I constantly think about products that aren't there today. Um, yeah, you, even with there when you were giving the dates of the iPhone and the dates of uh, you know, the demise of Kodak, et cetera, et cetera. It feels like it's not that long ago, but it also feels like it's years and years and years ago, right? It feels very ancient when you think about utilizing film-based cameras and such like, and, and how quickly that happened over, over a period. And we, we've seen very quick evolution that we've come almost desensitized to at various different stages right now. And I think, you know, when, when um, yeah, I, I've been thinking as you, as you were talking there about this, uh, this, you know, this magazine, the financial technologists we've got coming out next month with, with the title of appetite for disruption. It's, it's almost to me like a rebrand of appetite for evolution. Everyone has constantly got an appetite to see things grow and develop. We don't need to rip things up completely. I think it's very, very interesting what you say there about you know, the, 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 the sort of you know, peer to peer world sort of you know, evolving and, and developing into, into back. And, and you see the same sort of thing happening at the moment with digital assets where you know, this, is a, this is a world where they recognize that, that bad players have made it a very difficult um, arena to be taken seriously to completely uh, you know, overtake the, you know, the, the traditional financial area as, we, as we've seen it. And instead, it's like, right, we know that we need them and they need us to create a better future in terms of what we're looking at. So in terms of where you think that that sort of convergence, that confluence will happen between you know, banking and fintech and decentralized finance, what's, what's your view on where that sits? You know, even as we are talking right now, the thing that excites me a lot uh, is traditional players, both central banks and the large corporate, uh, large banks, from having pushed away decentralized finance as if it's uh, the devil uh, and, mm -hmm. and you know, that they will not touch, go anywhere near it, have finally pulled up the hood and, and looked on, under the hood and to, to see the technology that sits in decentralized finance. And Which has always been the big push, right? starting to use the same language. So I was looking at the experiments that the Singapore Monetary Authority has been doing with uh, the, the Swiss and the French uh, on um, wholesale, um, you know, cryptocurrency, I mean, wholesale payment processing. I, I refuse to call it central bank digital currency because uh, although they're calling it that, that's not what they're dealing with. But they're talking about automated uh, liquidity providers, okay? And, and that's uh, amazing. That's a language from cryptocurrencies, you know, that are finding their way into uh, traditional FX clearing, okay? And, and we're going to start seeing more of that. And I am very excited because that's what uh, traditional banks should have done when they looked at, um, you know, uh, what crypto and what decentralized finance was doing. In fact, traditional banks, 
uh, missed a couple of cues. Uh, they missed the first cue, which was the whole idea of um, uh, application development, uh, open source application development. They, they totally missed that, the cue on that one. And then they missed the cue on APIs and then on blockchain, right? So in the whole idea of blockchain to a traditional bank is that I'm still the intermediary. Uh, which then uh, negates the purpose of being a, a blockchain in the first place. All blockchains should be permissionless. Um, you know, if you're not permissionless, there's no reason for you to 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 want to dabble in the technology. So uh, it's interesting to see that we are now reaching a point where uh, the, the tra traditional players are beginning to look under the hood of um, of uh, decentralized finance, uh, and this will have a very a profound impact. Uh, on architecture in traditional banking. So one of the questions I asked when Chad GBT was coming on stream was that, hey, uh, now uh, banks don't need to revamp their core banking system uh, or, or consolidate their data centers to, or create a unified structure of any kind because you, you now have a machine learning which can pull data from anywhere. But that it's still early days. I've just asked the question. I'm, I'm still um, you know, talking to technology people who can give me the answers on this. Uh, but uh, it has it will have a profound effect uh, on how banks think about uh, even um, the traditional core banking systems. Yeah, it's it's a, it's an incredible opportunity, I think. And, it, and, it, and it, it's one for the better. And, and I think it, it, you know, whilst um, I think financial services have traditionally been very conservative for obvious reasons, for very relevant reasons around how they embrace technology. I think at the moment they can absolutely see this opportunity to you know, to do things in a completely different way uh, and, and, and far more efficiently for everyone involved in a process where there has been ever increasing pressure to do things you know, at, at less cost. So you're, you're looking to do more with less. Um, and that, you know, this, that, that provides that and opens that door for people to look at as well. I also think the the interesting thing about you, Emmanuel, is as we sort of highlighted before, you're a man of the world. Um, you globe trot, trot a lot. We're there in Estonia at the moment, but you spread, you spread your time between uh, Beijing, Singapore, New York. Um, you're over in England uh, um, you know, last week. Last week. Uh, and I think if you look at the at, at various different um, appetites in in all of those regions, there's definitely government led adoption to a few of these things. So we heard. Yeah, I think it was probably the week. It was probably the week before you were over that we were talking about um, Rishi Sunak and London Tech Week, talking about how we could sit, you know, create a crypto hub for the UK. Over the over the other side of the pond in the US, you're seeing you know people heralding the death of crypto and uh, uh, and and uh, the regulators coming in there to make it very difficult for businesses, which can create uh, uh, which can lose innovation to other parts of it. We've seen Asia uh, traditionally be very uh, active in in how. Uh, digital assets can you know can can shape the future and 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 in so doing creating a, a you know a massive advantage in terms of the rate of innovation that we're seeing out there. So, from your global view that you have of the world, um, tell us what the options are. You know the the thing that we need to remember about America is that uh, it will, and I think it was Winston Churchill who said that that America can be trusted to do the wrong thing until they absolutely have to do the right thing. Uh, yeah. you know, and they will do, they'll do everything else until uh, they, are, they can until they, they're forced to do the right thing. Uh, and um, and they just, um, you know, meander from one crisis to the next. And, and that's okay. how America creates, um, you know, global trends. Uh, America almost never creates policies, uh, meaning that th there, there is nothing in the American financial system that you can pull out a white paper or a, or a parliamentary uh, committee, um, you know, document uh, and 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 wave it and say, see, this is what we planned to do 30 years ago, and that's what we have today. Uh, it just moves from accident to accident. Uh, you know, the, uh, in 1971, the U.S. just decided unilaterally that it won't hold uh, the, the the value of the dollar to the price of gold, uh, and then took the rest of the world on a journey of floating their currencies. Right. So and the internationalization of the dollar is not uh, was not based on any uh, policy uh, that, that the Fed or the Treasury was pursuing. Uh, in fact, there was so much uh, American dollars floating outside of the U.S. that the, the, the law just came into effect to prevent it from coming back into the U.S. So you, you can't carry more than ten thousand dollars back into the U.S. today. <clears throat> you know, mm -hmm. So. 
so a lot of the a lot of the trends that we that we take uh, for granted um, when we look uh, at the first principles by which they were developed they were always developed out of crisis and out of uh, necessity so the crisis that i'm looking at right now uh, is the inability of governments to pay their debt you know the the us dollar us for example um, in during pandemic um, the total uh, state uh, developed debt in the US uh, and uh, rose to about $31 trillion. And in fact, it's now much, much more than that. Uh, and the US GDP is about $21 trillion at the best. At best. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, you now have an economy that will never, ever be able to uh, meet its debt obligations. So that's why I say in my book that uh, debt becomes the economy. Yeah, so, that's a really know, interesting point, yeah. You know, so so now we need to uh, start uh, visualizing what happens when uh, the the state's ability to generate debt uh, becomes indeterminate. Uh, actually, the state always had every state in the world uh, always has the indeterminate ability to issue debt. In other words, uh, it's uh, forever and ever. Every dollar, every pound uh, issued is an indeter- indeterminate uh, debt. You know, so so. Then the question is, when it gets onto the balance sheet, uh, what does the economy looks like? I mean, just to put that in perspective, uh, basically what I'm saying is that we are now entering uh, a global economy where the only way for states, uh, for any state, uh, to be able to issue debt indeterminately is to digitize it. Um, you know, and to make it available to as many investors out there as possible. And the state that is most likely to do that. Uh, out of desperation more than anything else, is the United States. So that's that's how I develop uh, my sense of where the push will or the pull will come from uh, for some of the innovations uh, making breakthroughs. Um, many of us today exist in ecosystems where we are asking the regulator to curate the process of innovation. You know, regulators uh, will are not going to give you a breakthrough in innovation that will take us to another realm altogether. In fact, all regulators around the world uh, want to protect uh, the ecosystem that they're familiar with. Uh, you know, Larry Summers thinks that you know what whatever happens, uh, you need to s- uh, save the the banking system first and foremost. That means uh, preserve the banking system and then and then let innovation take its course. Uh, that in itself has a self-preservation uh, instinct to it, which means that you know they that they will not innovate, that they will not uh, allow uh, new frontiers of technology to to take place. So if innovation takes place out of desperation, out of uh, out of necessity, uh, then we look for elements in in the global economy that will create those opportunities, uh, and they're coming, and and in, in, a, in a variety of forms. Absolutely. I 100% agree with that. And I think it's a variety of forms is exactly the case because there's so much different opportunity and so much evolution and revolution and and, uh, uh, innovation, whichever whichever one you want to look at and whichever whichever badge you want to hang on it, it gives us that opportunity. And one of those sort of areas, which which I think everyone's been talking about recently, and and, you know, we're, we're, this is, you know, you and I could be talking for hours and hours and hours about all of this sort of stuff. So I want to try and keep it to our usual sort of half hour thing and and finish up with one uh, one final sort of piece from you, which is the buzz around everything and, and, and opportunities have been around chat, chat GPT. Um, and when we spoke a, a couple of weeks ago, there'd been, uh, um, you know, it was the word on everyone's mouth. It sort of evolved a little bit more. We've seen people utilizing it, but you said something very, very interesting to me before coming on air about its use within financial services and actually how um, there's a very good chance of, uh, of the industry shooting itself in the foot with this and utilizing it in completely the wrong way. So, I think it's a great uh, way to uh, to bow out of the show by you uh, by you giving us the uh, the insight to what ChatGPT looks like at the moment uh, within financial services and how it can arrest it and save the day. So I looked at the JP Morgan deal with Bloomberg. Uh, basically, JP Morgan is using ChatGPT as a software uh, to train it on all of the contents that it has within its network, so that whatever the whatever the question the customer asks, the answer is still my product, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the thing is that they, 
they did that with um, robo advisors, for example, and and it was sold to customers as um, you know empowering you uh, in 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 being able to make your you know investment decisions and so on. But the algorithms of robo advisors are limited to the products that the bank has. So what do you think the answer is going to be? Um, you know, and uh, the interesting thing, and this is another element about technology, innovation, and breakthroughs, right? Technology is never a, a provider of critical advantage to any player. In fact, it ends up commoditizing everyone. So, and that's mm. what robo-advisors ended up doing. And before that, there was, and I say this in my book, which is the uh, advanced trading systems, um, you know, that that uh, that enab enables uh, the, the trades to be done very quickly and so on. Now, all of these technologies, uh, when they're first introduced, uh, the larger players introduce them as a critical advantage, and then uh, everybody else has, has it. And today you can actually download a robo-advisor uh, on, on, on the internet, uh, your own. Right, so it, it has been commoditized. Uh, so in the same way, uh, Chat GPT eventually, the open AI technology that that is being applied to institutions uh, will be commoditized, uh, and and then therefore it will not not be a, a critical advantage for uh, any one of the players. The problem that banks uh, have not broken out of uh, is that the solution is not in your data set. The data that is outside the institution is more important than the data that sits in the institution. Uh, and that's mm. something that uh, banks haven't come to terms with. And once you start thinking breakthrough in that way, uh, then you start understanding where the solutions will come from. And I think that's a, that's a really interesting because because I, I I think ChatGPT has is still being thought about as to how it can, you know its use cases have come through. And you know, the initial piece, as you're quite rightly saying, is is all self-interest. Uh, and, and actually, the scepticism I hear when I talk to people in the industry about what it does is, is it can't be used in financial services because it's approximately right. And if approximately right is good enough, uh, then we, ha we don't have to worry about AI. Everyone's very worried and self-interested in terms of what you're doing. But actually, it, to me, it's about how do we make this work and how can we... Yeah, uh... in fact, when bankers talk that way, they, they, they are actually patting themselves uh, um, you know, on their shoulder uh, way more than they were. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, the decision to invest and the nature of assets in the future, and that's another conversation that we can have. Uh, there's nothing approximately right or wrong about anything. Uh, the mm -hmm. personalization of finance is how the individual envisions his own uh, asset class, his own mix of assets and, and his view of the world. Uh, and that's got nothing to do with you, Mr. Banker. Uh, you know, <laughs> so, so this is the... Uh, this is a change in paradigm that's required uh, to be able to make the most of technology. And then the question to ask is, what is the role of the intermediary uh, in such a circumstance? That's yeah. when you start seeing that banks have understood uh, the, the transitions that, that they're undergoing right now. It's almost as if you were saying that it's an element of arrogance in some areas of banking, which is uh, completely alien to anyone, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a self-supposition. <laughs> they, they believe when when I when actually when I when I first published this book, uh, you know, and the title is "The Great Transition: The Personalization of Finance." Is here every banker when I did my launches in a different city thought he understood what I was talking about. You know <laughs> that that yes, I know personalization. We 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 know this. You know, this is what we're doing in our respective institutions, and I'm saying that. Actually, I'm talking about something uh, way beyond uh, what you think you know, um, you know, and and um, it also has to do with uh, um, you know how uh, we perceive, perceive what what wealth and uh, protection of wealth is uh, going forward, and the network generation, the the you know Gen Zs and the Gen As who are coming on stream right now, uh, their understanding of assets. Uh, is going to be so dramatically different from what we understand today that you know then we understand what it is that uh, we are protecting uh, and and what needs to be given in order to to embrace something that's new that's coming through. I think it's a really important um, generational point there um, that people have you know we, we had this conversation in a uh, uh, in in a debate I did yesterday where we were looking at that that sort of aspect and I think this digitally native generation that are coming through just expect different things and uh, uh, and and the industry has to change so look, I I feel I feel almost sad that we've got to bring this uh, conversation to an end today because it could be one that will roll and roll and roll 
Um, we've done it uh, a couple of time, times now on this subject. There's plenty, plenty more to come. So I want you to become a regular uh, uh, on this uh, on this show, Emmanuel. And I'd love to have you back on. Yeah, Toby, we, we, we only got a time to, 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 to do sound bites about some of the ideas. I know, there. I know. We've got a lot more to discuss. Uh, I and, hope and, that. And we, and we've been talking about getting it done in person as well. So we, we will have oh, yeah, to do that nice. and, make, and make sure make sure we actually do this uh live and and uh and in person soon so next i'm sure london. that i'm sure this i'm sure the stars will, stars will align well either i'll be in new york or you'll be in london at the same time we missed it i was in new york you were in london last time we worked right. out so we'll get there and we'll get there in short it's been absolutely brilliant having you on the show fascinating as always and uh um i do encourage everyone to to go out there and buy the book um the great transition uh it's but it's findable everywhere and uh and, and you won't be disappointed it's a it's a treasure trove of information and insight and thought but thought leadership on it all so well done on it and and uh i know you're working on more behind it as well and i can't wait to hear what you've got in store next so emmanuel it needs me to say thank you so so much for joining us on the show today and uh loved having you on good fun toby well, let's do it again Absolutely. as always as always and enjoy estonia i hope you have a great weekend out there and uh, do some do some good exploring and thank you all for watching we will see you soon on another episode of FinTech Focus TV. Thanks a lot.